All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, hello, welcome to our talk, Integrating GitLab into the World Kernel, Red Hat Kernel Workflow. My name is Don Zikas, and with me presenting is Prayer Bargava. <laughs> Today, we're going to talk about GitLab and how the Red Hat Kernel team is using it for their workflow, and if there's an opportunity for the upstream community to increase its use of GitLab's services. So let's start with a simple question. How to get Linus to accept a pull request from GitLab? And maybe he already does, uh, but my goal here is to help encourage more of that. So we know the community has looked at Git forges like GitHub and GitLab. There have been challenges. The services do not always conform to the kernel community rules. In some cases, they can be made to work. Regardless, I'd like to increase the usage of the services, at least for GitLab. Recently, the Red Hat kernel team went through a migration from a very old Patchwork v1 server to GitLab. The migration took about a year, and a lot of new tooling had to be incorporated. We worked with the GitLab development team to resolve a dozen or so issues. With the relationship Red Hat has built recently with GitLab and the use of its services, we are looking to help lead the effort to improve GitLab overall to allow it to be a common alternative location as a, the source of pull requests for kernel maintainers. As I said, the Red Hat kernel team transitioned to GitLab this year. Before I prayer get into the solutions we implemented in GitLab, I wanted to talk about issues we had with our old workflow and how they're similar to some of the issues we see in upstream workflow. Like upstream, we had an email-based workflow with a central mailing list. Patches conformed to the upstream posting rules with the addition of some extra metadata, that metadata being a bugzilla tag and, and a build tag. Further, our reviews followed similar upstream rules, which meant we had we only accepted patches with an act by line, or we, we blocked patches with a, with a NAC by line. And using Patchworks patch processing, this workflow helped us organize and track what patches were posted and which patches were ready for inclusion. Over time, the volume of patches increased, and with the addition of CI, tracking the readiness of patches became very difficult for our maintainers. Our kernel maintainers turned to custom scripts to handle the tracking and monitoring of the volume. Of course, this was all tied to a Mutt-like client. We had strict internal review, review rules that allowed maintainers to only take patches when discussions were resolved and the correct developers act the patch. This led our maintainers to have, having to read almost every email to ensure those rules were met. Human typos frequently fail their automation rules, causing unrealized delays. We created sub-maintainers just like Upstream that quickly turned into full-time jobs and not the promised part-time role. Next, even our reviewers struggled to figure out which patches they need to review versus what was already reviewed. Sorting unread and unreviewed email on a high-volume list is an art form. Reviewers were frequently had to load a side web page that provided the summary status of the patches that needed reviews in order to keep up. Other quirks included having the CI process as a bolt-on and not fully integrated for easy access. It's hard to gate patches on a CI email box. Updated patch versions were tricky. RHEL posts large backports to update subsystems. Reposting a 100 patch patch set for a small change in a single patch generated noise for reviewers and maintainers. Getting those patches re-reviewed created more delays. And finally, our business logic wasn't front and center. The most frequent question around posted patches was, what is holding this patch set up? It wasn't obvious and led to this side web status page I alluded to before. After about 10 years of this, our general process and exceptions around the process become complex. Our maintainers were reaching limitations of handling the volume. We needed to make a change. This is where we turned to GitLab. Let me turn this over to Prayer to talk about how GitLab helped save our workflow. Thanks, Don. As Don described, we had several significant problems with an email-based workflow at Red Hat. I'm going to go through how we fixed these problems and how moving to GitLab not only fixed issues for maintainers, but contributors and reviewers as well. Slide. I'm going to assume that most of you have seen or used the GitLab web UI. As part of my explanation of fixes, I'm also going to show you the output of a tool that Red Hat has heavily contributed to called Lab. 
Lab is a command line tool that interfaces with GitLab. And I want to show you the tool because I think most of us prefer working on the command line. And one of the fears of kernel maintainers, reviewers, and contributors is being forced to work on a web UI. Lab allows you to do anything the web UI does, including commenting on commits, opening merge requests, commenting on merge requests by opening up blocking threads, approving code and merging code, and many of the other mundane GitLab tasks. It's a powerful tool that is open source and supported by a small group of developers, and Red Hat is really involved in improving it. So let's look at the issues that Don brought up that were causing difficulty for the maintainers. The first of these was, slide, the customization of scripts. That doesn't seem like a big deal to most developers and reviewers, but as we all know, maintaining work scripts is an expensive endeavor. As Don said, each of our maintainers had different scripts to maintain a tree. This led to some cases where some maintainers would detect an error and another maintainer would not. GitLab provides webhooks, which are scripts that execute on a GitLab action. For example, a webhook can run whenever a merge request is opened. A webhook can run whenever a merge request is updated or commented upon. A webhook can run, really, on almost any GitLab action. We use the, we use the webhooks to remove much of the customization that maintainers were doing. For example, we have a webhook that verifies that there's a signed off by tag. Another example, and unlike upstream, at Red Hat, each change must be associated with a bugzilla. So we have a webhook that verifies that a bugzilla tag has been added to each commit and the merge request description. I'll get back to the merge request description in a few moments. Slide. Failures of the webhooks result in unique labels being added to the merge request. Continuing the bugzilla example, if a commit was missing a bugzilla tag, a bugzilla needs review label would be added to the merge request indicating to the contributor, reviewers, and the maintainers that something was wrong with the commit. The webhooks also add a public comment indicating that there was a problem with the commit and provides a pointer to our documentation, commit rules. We also have labels for missing signed off buys, incorrectly formatted commit messages, etc. Back over to that script customization problem. As I was saying, using the webhooks allowed us to minimize the amount of customization that the maintainers were doing. Part of that, as I just explained, was checking each merge request description had a ch and change set had a bugzilla and signed off tag. We have the signed off type signed off by tag requirement because the merge request description is used in the merge commit. So we need a signed off by tag on that merge commit from the author. That is now all automated away in webhooks. And we've done a large amount of work to automate away as many of these simple tasks as possible. Slide. The next problem Don mentioned was that it wasn't very easy to track reviews. The great thing about email is that it's easy to comment on commits, descriptions, test results, or really anything else. The problem with email, however, is it isn't that easy for a maintainer to sift through all that traffic and find those reviews and comments. Maintainers at Red Hat, <coughs> excuse me, and I'm sure upstream must read through each and every comment to determine if a commit is ready to be merged. GitLab solves this by automatically threading comments and replies. These in GitLab parlance are called threads, and all the threads are organized per merge request. Each thread represent one question about the code, and all of this is now easily tracked within the merge request itself. GitLab also provides an easy to use method to approve code. There's a big fat approve button on each merge request that signifies a reviewer's sign off that the code can be merged. Red Hat is migrating away from email based reviews to using GitLab threads and approvals. And in fact, we no longer see anyone using email based approvals. The approve button process was adopted quite quickly within Red Hat. The approvals are all tracked within the merge request, so maintainers don't have to sift through email to find them. Slide. Another problem is who has to do a review and who is responsible for a review. Upstream has long used the maintainers and get maintainer PL scripts so that contributors would know who to CC for a review. 
but that's just another step that contributors have to remember or configure in their Git hooks every time they check out a tree. We took the approach that all contributors have to do that task over and over again. So we automated it. The way it works is that when a merge request is generated, the webhooks examine the code in the merge request and assign maintainers and reviewers based on the data in our owners.yaml file. That owners.yaml file is synonymous with maintainers. And in fact, we use our owners.yaml file to create our own maintainers file called RH maintainers. We have two categories of reviews, required approvers and reviewers. Required approvers are just that, required. Required approvers must review the change set prior to be being merged into RHEL. Reviewers, on the other hand, can review, but their acceptance of the changes in the merge request does not gate that merge request. We also recognize that we have some engineers who are only interested in changes. They don't want to be formally recognized as a reviewer, but do want a notification of change because it might affect their code. For example, we have some network driver maintainers that want to be notified on core networking changes. We have tooling which anybody can sign up for and be at notified when a change to a file or a directory occurs. We've also added per subsystem acts labels. These are generated by the webhooks and indicate whether reviews from a specific subsystem are needed. For example, the acts x86, sorry, the acts x86 needs review indicates that an x86 maintainer must review the code. And the PC, acts PCI OK indicates that a PCI reviewer has already approved the code. Slide. As Don mentioned in the email workflow, our CI testing was kind of bolted on. It was completely separate from patch generation and there wasn't anything that required a pass for testing. Our engineers learned to ignore testing results and were often confused by the results. With GitLab and really any Git Forge for that matter, we were able to integrate CI directly into the process. Okay, I'm gonna take a quick sidebar here. Let's face it, CI testing isn't that exciting to most maintainers, but it should be. And it should be on the other side of the equation too. It's good that contributors like myself know their code is being tested. It does nothing but add stability to the kernel and that's obviously a good thing. The problem though with email CI is that it's just not well integrated at Red Hat or upstream. Consider Intel's testing upstream CI. I'm not aware that CI is being run when I submit a patch upstream. I only get an email, sometimes days later, depending on the test queue, that says my testing passed or failed. I have no status indication that says testing is occurring. I have no easy way to look at the tests or discussing them with the test writer. I had a lot of problems to tackle in this testing area and I could easily fill this 45 minutes and probably the whole morning, detailing the work that Michael Hoffman and Veronica Kabatova and her team accomplished in this area. Some highlights are simple things. How do we identify and report a failure? That's something we're constantly improving on and we still don't have right. We received a lot of feedback from our engineering staff on the failures and we continue to improve upon things. We've set up documentation that specifically addresses failures so the contributors don't have to read through the entire CI documentation. Each test now has an owner, so that person's name is also in the testing output. They're aware that they may need to help diagnose logs, et cetera, related to their testing, so they may know they may be called upon by engineers to help diagnose test failures. How do we identify and report test failures that have nothing to do with the change set, like an infrastructure failure? As you can imagine, that's been difficult to figure out. But we've made some progress here, and the test infrastructure failures are slowly being identified and called out in the test logs. Slide. Reviewing isn't really a maintainer issue per se, but it's definitely worth bringing up as something that which clearly impacts the maintainers. And most maintainers are actually reviewers. In the email-based workflow, reviewers had to take an email, 
save it, apply it to their tree, and hope it applied. There was a lot of process in just simply getting the patch set. Tools like Patchwork made this easier, but even that wasn't foolproof. It required manual intervention for new versions and other manual steps to get patch sets out. The convenient thing about a Git forge is that reviewers now work directly out of a Git repository. The unit of change in email was a patch set, and in GitLab, it's now a merge request. Reviewers can check out the merge request in their local tree and just look at it. Reviewers don't have to muck around with saving patches, etc. Reviewers can just look directly at the code as it was submitted, comment on it, and have it all contained within the merge request. And if a reviewer is really stuck in the old way of doing things, they can simply run git format patch to get emails and use those patches in their review process. GitLab will tell anyone who looks at the merge request exactly what the status of the change set is. If the change set in the merge request has a conflict due to someone else's code being merged, GitLab will notify in the merge request and in the email that there was a problem. If it's blocked by a review, there's an indicator for that too. If you still want a newsreader style output of all the comments across a project akin to a mailing list, you can get that too. GitLab has built-in RSS feeds that provide a variety of levels of information. If you really want to see all the output from all the merge requests, you can subscribe to a feed that provides that. Or if you only want to see merge requests as they come in, there's a feed for that too. Slide. This is our shameless plug slide. Here are some links to projects where you can see our process in action. ARC and CentOS Stream are fully integrated into this process. As I briefly mentioned, one of the restrictions we have in RHEL and CentOS Stream is that all modifications require a bugzilla. This isn't the case in ARC, however, so it's a little bit easier to make changes and see how things work there. We have detailed documentation for CentOS Stream that explains how you can contribute to CentOS Stream and includes links to our commit rules. And I've also included a pointer here for our tooling for contributors. And lastly, here's another link to lab. If you're already using GitLab, I strongly encourage you to try out lab. Its interface is trivial to learn and once you use it, you'll likely never go back to using the web UI. From issues opened against lab, I know several other large uh, development groups have adopted its use. With that, I'll hand things back over to Don. Don, you're muted. You're muted, muted, muted. Thank you, Pratt. Uh, thanks, Pratt, for that. As we spend more time with using GitLab, we uncover various issues. Over the past year, we've built up a relationship with GitLab to ensure we have a direct path for the development team to resolve these issues. We've worked with them to resolve and deploy at least 15 issues over the last six months. Most of this work is around API and tooling. In addition, we have a dedicated developer who is working on issues the GitLab team does not have the bandwidth to resolve. This has led to two MRs over the last two months that have been deployed. The point here is that Red Hat has a strategic relationship with GitLab and is willing to exploit that to help address any gaps as blocking upstream from utilizing their service more. Which circles back to my original question. How to get Linus to accept a pull request from GitLab? Again, maybe he does. But my real goal is here is how to encourage more use of it or allow uh, people to experiment with it. So we're already familiar with some of the issues already with this. Um, for example, chain of trust. There have been people talking about the chain of trust, about how PRs need from Linus to Linus need to be signed, including ones from a forge. I'm not sure if that's something that's email, a personal email configuration or if that's something to do with a the forge. There's that topic. Uh, merge request logs. I've seen talks about concerns about how the merge request logs look in a forge. Um, and maybe they're not exactly formatted in a way that upstream can utilize them. And there's a common one I know, I know Constantine's talked about this a lot, a single point of failure. Um, what happens if GitLab closes the shop and changes its behavior or get bought by another company? So that's a good question. How can we limit this risk by continuously pulling necessary data out of GitLab while, returning its, while retaining its services for development? 
So you know, some of the things I've we've come up with is there's some interesting pieces of data that are important um, inside GitLab and obviously there's a tree itself we can you can mirror that that's that's pretty easy to do but I know a couple uh, Monday I think Constantine's presentation talked about um, how comments are the breadcrumbs of decision making and we've ex we have prototypes inside our uh, inside Red Hat that can take every comment to a GitLab project and spit them out to a public inbox if necessary that way all that information can be continue to be made public regardless if the, the service goes down or disappears or changes its, its uh, terms of agreement. So we're looking to see if there's other pieces of information that need to be continuously pulled out of GitLab in order to alleviate that problem. And, and in addition, is there any other feedback or thoughts that people have that um, is blocking a more wider acceptance of, of GitLab that we can do to encourage and, and resolve? Um, Obviously, it's not everyone's cup of tea, but it is. Uh, we do like to, I, I would like to actively encourage its use, and I want to know what people's thoughts are about how, um, what are some of the hangups. So, uh, other than that, thank you, and uh, I'd like to turn it over to questions to see what type of feedback we got. It's very active chat. <laughs> it, it is very active, and there's a couple of things that I might want to address there, Don. Um, uh, one thing I, I think I saw Greg Cage mention it that he's he's uh, keeps pointing back over at Garrett. Um, Greg, uh, I think one of the things that I want to stress, uh, Zikis less so than myself. <laughs> I'll admit this. <laughs> he's smiling because he knows what I'm about to say. I'm I'm not a hundred percent convinced GitLab is the way forward, and nor are we saying that. We're, we're obviously advocating for GitLab because we put a lot of resources into it, but a Git Forge model here also applies to what we had to do. And I think that's important to, to, uh, to, for us to, to uh, acknowledge that I think that there's fear just moving from an email based workflow to a Git Forge based workflow. And we're trying to clear up a lot of that FUD that's out there. Um, the second thing, Don, that I saw that was uh, interesting. Actually, I, I'm going to get right. I'm going to zip down to D Dmitry Vayukov. I hope I didn't butcher that name too badly. He asked, uh, "Let me find uh, something about resources." This is just. This is exactly what he wrote. This is just great in all respects. Do you have any estimation of the human resources involved in making this happen? Uh, in integrating all the pieces, I, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Now, obviously, what Red, uh, what Prayer talked about, Red Hat has a, a more uh, elaborate and complex business model. So we have you know, we have certain rules about making sure everyone reviews it, the right review people, because it's liability as a product, and yada yada yada. So what we implement is probably a little bit more complicated than what the upstream needs to implement. But um, as for Okay, I see you're integrating deploy and, and adding hooks and stuff like that. There is some complexity there. Web hooks aren't free. You need to you need to stage them somewhere and set up servers. And we're working with GitLab to see how we can make this easier. Um, I think GitHub added some features allow this to make it easier, where you can just a couple of clicks and they'll 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 uh, send out the hooks for you. GitLab is a little bit more complicated, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but if that's if this stuff is useful and you want to. I can work with GitLab to see how we can simplify it so it becomes a couple clicks or a configuration item and we can roll it out. I, I think webhooks are one of the, the biggest perks we've had in our workflow in, in automation. Lukash Stelmash, I think. Uh, again, uh, I'm going to apologize to everybody for butchering your names. Uh, my apologies, has asked. Does GitLab support matrix communication? I have no idea. I don't know the answer to that either. Constantine. Dan, actually, Daniel popped in. I wasn't sure if you had a, a question. Oh, I didn't see that. Sorry, Daniel, did yeah. I turn you off? No, no, that's fine. Uh, look, I just want to pop my Patrick maintainer hat on for a moment and say uh, internally, you've obviously clearly outgrown patchwork and i'm glad to see that you've 
got a solution that works better for you. There is absolutely no universe in which patchwork would handle the sorts of things that you're doing. Um, we try. I, you know, we try. I know. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a lot of good uh, contributions from Red Hat to Patchwork, for which I'm very grateful. Um, I want to suggest for people with less complicated workflows, Patchwork has got better in terms of CI support. Uh, the NetDev BPF list and the Linux PPC dev list are examples where um, CI tests are getting run on every patch as it gets submitted. Uh, so we're trying uh, on, on a bunch of these things. It will never be what Red Hat needs, but I think we are trying to get closer to what Upstream needs. Excellent. Good to hear. Greg, did you, uh, you have some comments? Oh, we lost Greg. Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, wrong button. Turn the camera off. Um, this is cool in that you added all of Garrett functionality onto GitLab, which is great because you guys need that for your internal tree. Um, other development trees have been doing this for a very long time. Um, what is your sense of, I'm curious as to what sense of scale, how many patches are you dealing with? What's your rate of change? How are you, how are, how fast and what's your quantity that you're working with? So our scale is a, a traditional RHEL live stream update um, is about 15 to 16,000 patches every six months, um, broken across different patch sets. I mean, our patch sets are huge or back. I'm not sure if everyone so understands. Are you adding, adding 15,000 patches per every three months? Yes. Okay. Uh, again, I'm not sure everyone understands the RHEL development models. We, we fork a tree. Yeah, yeah I, I do. I'm just kind of curious as to back how fast. Hundreds of patches, I mean, it's kind of silly. Right, right. I'm just kind of curious as to how, I mean, because if you look at some of the development trees we got today, we're running at, what, nine, ten changes an hour is what's getting worked in Linus's tree, right? That's a right. change. Exactly. No, agreed. Um, small changes all populated from you know, different maintainers trees. And again, we tried to emulate that model for a number of years using an email-based workflow. Our business logic just kept getting in the way. <laughs> um, okay, and so that, that's cool. So, so it's it, for a medium-sized project like yours that works well. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm just I'm just trying to get a sense of scale. I mean, you couldn't centralize system with ten changes an hour isn't going to cut it. I know Kubernetes had to really, really, really beat on the back end to try and make a make a rate of change that fast to get github and that ci workflow working well um, yep. so this is nice because i mean that's more than like android has but it's way less than what the kernel has um did you see constantine's talk about before and why the kernel community can't do centralized um infrastructure i i i saw his talk um i don't remember the arguments for why centralized and again I, i'm not don't get me wrong, I'm not looking to have GitLab be the place for development. I'm just looking, you know, every sub maintainer can have its own workflow. If some choose to do GitHub, Garrett, Patchwork, maybe GitLab can be part of that piece. Just, I figure each sub maintainer has its own style of workflow. The end result is you collect all the patches in a, in a GitLab instance and you do a pull request to Linus. Linus can do his own workflow. That's, I'm not looking to centralize it, just trying to give it an opportunity. centralizing a subsystem, which is scary. I know DRM did this. Right. Yes. But you are centralizing a subsystem and that has the potential to cut out the sub maintainers choosing to centralize the subsystem. Right. They do. I, I agree. But but if you do that, like so if it happens to be on GitHub, you just lost China, right? Because they can't contribute to that. <laughs> I mean, there are issues involved there, right? And which is why you know, sub maintainers gotta choose make the right decision, right? I mean I, I can't choose for them. I'm just trying to provide the opportunity. Okay. They, that's cool. If that so, may, if time is an issue, I can we can work with you. No, 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 that's cool. So, um, but my other are, is is this all pushed back into the regular Git uh, lab infrastructure so it now emulates the Garrett workflow basically? <laughs> we looked at Garrett. Um, people had some struggles with using it effectively in their workflow, so we we kind of leaned you know, away. You added all the features that Git. Lab was missing that Garrett provides, <laughs> like Probably. like owners and checking the sign off by and all those yep. infrastructure tools that Probably. Garrett provided. That, that's cool. That's fine. But it's just 
it's just kind of funny to watch. I read to the Greg, wheel. Greg, if I may interject, uh, sorry, Zach, I didn't mean to cut you off. Greg, if I may interject, I remember that we sat down at some point and looked at the Git forges, and this was two, two and a half years ago, probably. Um, I don't know how far Garrett has leapt forward in that time, but I remember back then they were they didn't have a lot of these features then. Uh, so I think maybe things moving forward, they've maybe implemented some of this stuff. But yeah, I remember I we, the sense of scale when, but yeah, but also remember Garrett is self-hosted. It's not. Oh, hosted. absolutely. So absolutely. Um, again, uh, while, while we are using GitLab, we're not we're not suggesting that that it be the place. But certainly if, it, if we, you know, one of the concerns we were, or one of the questions we're asking here, which is Zix's question on, on the first slide is effectively, could we push code from uh, a GitLab, from GitLab and have Linus accept it? Well, he takes a pull from any maintainer stream, no matter where it is. That's not an issue. Okay. Well, I he mean, had so some comments he, the other day. Well, he does. I mean, he wants to make sure it's a signed tag and we trust the infrastructure, but. Sure. If you look, we he pulls a DRM tree, which I think is supposed to on a GitLab instance today. I thought it was set up on a clone somewhere, but okay, maybe. I know DRM is. I know, but I'm yeah. saying it, that's the only rule: sign tag, trusted maintainer, tree somewhere, oh. right? The workflow is what is the more important thing, not the location. Right. So, when, what subsystem maintainers are you going to work with to convince them about this? Whatever, I guess whoever I mean, wants to. Don't you have some on staff that work with this flow today that love it so much they want to do it for their open source work? Uh, I mean, I work with uh, the DRM team a lot. I'm working. So they have their own already. I agree. Yeah. But I'm just saying, we yeah, have well, your I... existing maintainers that work for you that are used to this and are willing to do it. Yeah, I mean, speaking as an existing maintainer, right? One of the things that I've always been really worried about is we have to collaborate with other subsystems. And that means that if there is information that ends up getting orphaned such that it's only available on a website, I'm going to get worried about that. Now, if it's stuff like, say, integration testing, integration testing is currently being done separately anyway, right? I mean, whether we do it on kernel CI or it's integrated into a GitLab CI flow. It's a separate website. And to be honest, if you think about the noise that might get involved if we tried to inject a huge amount of you know, CI you know, reports uh, through email, I could imagine that getting you know, a little bit daunting. But the thing that I really, really worry about is discussions. Right? I think one of the big worries people had with Garrett is if you have uh, comments uh, uh, for the code review that are on Garrett, they're not available anywhere else. Uh, and it's made worse by the fact that Garrett can be self-hosted. Although again, I'll note GitLab can be self-hosted, right? I mean, we could run a gitlab.kernel.org, right? But suppose we did that. Right now, we might have some portion of the comments on gitlab.kernel.org and some portion of the comments that are on the mailing list. Right. And so I imagine you may have had that situation when you were transitioning from an email based workflow to a web based workflow, where at a certain point it started, you know, shifting because if you needed to do a search, now you had to search. The mailing list you and the, the Git forge, right? Work yeah. both ways. Yep. Yeah. So you know, either that or you have to basically do something where you know, in theory, one could set it up so that all of the um, you know GitLab discussions end up getting mirrored onto the mailing list, right? Um, and I don't know how well that would work, right? But that would be one of my concerns, right? So suppose ext4 used a GitLab instance, right? Well, I don't really care which one it is, right? And I'm having a conversation that also needs to include the XFS folks, right? Or the MM folks, right? Now, if we look at what Bugzilla did, 
they were trying to include all of the web metadata in the email. So even though we had email Bugzilla integration, um, the email looked really ugly, right? And it's sort of a question of is, is it initially a web-based um, system first or is it a mail-based system first, right? So if you look at LKML plus lore, it is email first and then we've added the, e the uh, web backend as an adjunct so that we can do better searching and all the rest. But it's clear that email was the primary. And so the challenge I see if I were a subsystem wanting to actually try to use this is if I have to work with some other subsystem that is still in the email first paradigm and we need to have a joint conversation with them, right? That was the problem we had with bugzilla.kernel.org, right? Which was, it, you knew it was coming from bugzilla.kernel.org and people said that it looked ugly and it broke email chaining and a whole bunch of other things. And so to me, that's sort of the challenge, which is if we wanted to make it work, right? That would be my first question is how do I make sure that I can, you know, that email continues to remain a first class citizen, right? You know, maybe GitLab also becomes a first class citizen, but they have to be co-equal or I can't imagine how we would make the transition work. Okay, that's fantastic feedback. Um, so we, we, we do have an email bridge right now. That's how we transition people to who are used to email into the new tools. I and mean, we set that up for a year. And it's actually running on the on the Fedora Rawhide space um, currently as, as an example. Uh, we didn't plan on propping up for a long time. We're hoping that we can transition to the tools, but you, you bring up a fantastic point. It, it's, it's one of the biggest internal pain points, um, probably from the file system team at Red Hat, <laughs> about discussions, um, about how do, you, how do you continue discussions on, on going from, from GitLab uh, to a team that's used to email cl collaboration and, and easily CCing people. So we're still working through this pain point. It's, you know, GitLab isn't perfect yet, but again, we're trying to collect feedback to figure out how we can over time transition it to something that's a lot more usable and solves the problems exactly like you just said. And I, I'd love to tackle that problem somehow. Thank you, Ted. Constantine, Constantine. please go ahead. You've been waiting so patiently. Uh, I just have a general comment that the main reasons why I'm not really excited about putting GitLab or any other solution like that at the kernel.org is that we have an experience of Bugzilla, which Ted already mentioned, that it's a tool that is sort of being, have been used, it's been largely abandoned, but we are now stuck with basically trying to remove all the spam. Like a dog chunk of my day is just removing spam from Bugzilla. And there's tools I can use to, I've used tools to simplify this, but the, my concern is that once the tool is added, it is almost impossible to then remove it because there's, a couple of people that will be dependent on it, and a couple of workflows will be dependent on it. So adding a, a central feature at kernel.org like this just guarantees that we are going to have to maintain it for the next X years, regardless of how few people use it. Now, the problem is that if it's knocked out, right? I mean, kernel.org is not hard to DDLS, you know, where we don't run huge infra because because primarily it doesn't matter that we are out or not. If, if you can't reach kernel.org, development does not stop. Right. If if somebody DDoSs Viger, if Viger is down for some reason, people still exchange emails and send patches around and, and work still gets done. It's an inconvenience, but it's not a everything stopped working so we can't get anything done kind of situation. So if, if we add a central feature like this and it get and it goes down because either I screwed up and something's unavailable or somebody's maliciously actively trying to make it not work. My concern is that how do we avoid the situation where nothing can get done because somebody doesn't want to get done. The usual example I have is that there's a zero day that affects billions of dev devices worldwide and you are an attacker who wants to make sure that it doesn't get patched for as long as possible, right? So you will attack any infrastructure that is aimed at fixing this problem. How do we avoid how do we avoid the situation? If they have to go back to email, then we haven't really solved anything, right? We're still falling back to email. So we, we the email is still the primary mechanism of making sure stuff is done. Right. And that's why we, we chose gitlab.com as a, as a as our hosting site because they're replicated across geos and use they use Google Cloud underneath. Uh, to kind of mitigate it doesn't eliminate the risk, but it, it mitigates it because and they have that's a little bit more infrastructure than kernel.org is. Um, I, I don't, other than that, I 
don't think I have a clear answer to your, your question. Um, but if, I use, if you're using Google Cloud, then you know suddenly you have chunks of the world that cannot use it, right? Um, that, that, that is another problem, right? Um, there is China that has trouble accessing Google services. A couple of weeks ago, Russia had trouble accessing some Google services because every now and again, you know, po politics gets involved and suddenly a, a large cloud provider becomes a not acceptable solution. So then people say, well, host it on your own, then you have a problem of, well, how much do we have to pay and how far do we want to scale this to be able to, to, uh, to make it accessible for everybody. Fair enough, and we have a, a large uh, test team in China, so that would that would impact the Red Hat's ability to deliver its, its raw products if, if that was the case. So we know GitLab works in China <laughs> because of that. But you're right; these are good questions. I I, um, I don't have clear answers to, uh, and that, I guess that's why you advocate for email because email is is so redundant. Well, I, I advocate for a distributed. I mean, email currently is the only sort of a, a solution that we have. I, I'm not saying we should stick to email as long as possible, only because currently we're using it. It works, it's attributed. You don't have to rely on any one company. You can, there's a lot of good stuff that is actually built into email that we kind of try, don't really forget, but we, um, we're, we, we suffer from bad corporate decisions that are around email, right? Um, trying to attempt to solve this by removing SMTP gateways out of the way. But um, what the, I mean, I'm not opposed to subsystems doing this on their own or doing it with, within companies or asking us to do it as long as it doesn't become one a, in an opaque place where stuff just gets, discussions go and die there, right? We want to be able to see them. We want to be continuously export them out. Like the, uh, yes, I said, let, let's provide a public inbox of all activity that's happening so that we can monitor it and, and people can query it and people can see what is actually happening at a GitLab instance here or a Garrett instance there. And two, let's make sure that if something happens and the infrastructure goes away or, or somebody pulls a plug and says, you know, we're done, we're done, this didn't work out, that this doesn't just die in, a, in a, some database that gets dumped and never really, referred to we want to make sure make sure that this is a there is a fossil record that that exists people can go back to and can refer to which is part of the reason why lore is such a good thing because you know there's just there's email that that's there from the 90s from 2000s that we can go back we can we can dig and figure out what happened how did this how, how did wh wh how did all this come into place what is the decision trail but dumping dumping gitlab data to public inbox solves a chunk of this but not all of it right um, as long as you can re retrace decisions, I think that's all people really want to know. And like, if you can dump the patches and, and reviews that are in a format that that is cross-platform as, as much as you can, which is usually Git format, patch format. Right. And, and that's what we're, we, we have some prototypes in-house to kind of do that using public inboxes and output. But I, I think you've, we talked about this before a couple of days ago, is that it, it is a one-way street. And I think you were looking for a two-way street in some situation. Oh, I'm not, but other people would really want it to be two-way street because they don't want to have to go to like this subsystem site to you know, suggest a feature, this subsystem site. You know, people who work across trees, right? The usually, usually the security people, they want to say, let's let's fix this uh, bug uh, situation so it doesn't happen anywhere. So they need to work with every subsystem. Currently, it's just a bunch of CCs and a bunch of mailing lists, right? But, but if they have to go to this GitLab, here and this get left there and that and that Garrett there and this thing there to just to coordinate everything. I think that's going to degrade the process instead of really improving it. And yes, it improves in parts of it, but then it will it will make it worse for others. Okay. So, so what I'm hearing from all these conversations is is that you know the, it's not the tool itself or the service itself that people are are uh, against or not really are. Uh, again, this isn't the right word, but it's really preserving the conversation. It's the collaboration that people are, aren't aren't convinced that GitLab can can handle correctly that the kernel community has developed over the last 10, 20, 30 years. Is that an accurate statement? Sort of, yeah. When you look at the, you know, Linux has been around for 30 years. How do we make sure that you know, 30 years later, we are not sort of a bunch of thief thumbs that nobody really knows what happens around. Right? How do we keep this as inclusive and as decentralized as possible as we've had it up to this point? Do you see email being still usable 30 years from now? Uh, some sort of 
some sort of messaging net platform, right? I, if it's not email, then it has to be something else. But right. uh, it needs to remain decentralized. At least that's in my, that's what I try to push for. Still using IRC. Sorry, Clark, what was that? Yeah, we're still using IRC. <laughs> We need to start looking at the idea of uh, putting together a uh, an interchange format. I mean, we're start, we're talking about the same sort of artifacts here, right? We're talking about discussion of why we should do something, and then an implementation detail that says, "Here, here's a patch. This fixes this problem we were talking about in this discussion." Um, you know, maybe we could come up with some sort of JSON or XML format that says this is how you describe uh, a discussion on a particular problem and here are some uh, some artifacts that address it uh, and then we could do some translation stuff to pass that thing around so that from out of GitLab could flow the discussions and gateway them into LKML to be stored in lore uh, do the same thing in GitHub um, Garrett I don't know I, I, is it is it a problem I, that that seems to be the theme that's coming through in all the discussion here is not, oh, we hate GitLab or we hate Git Forges. It's not really that. It's the fact that information flow is the important part here. Redundancy and distributed, uh, you know, resilience in the face of attack or failure. So, and right now, yeah, email is kind of the the de facto standard. So you hit the there... you hit the nail on the head there. That's that's the feedback that I think I'm getting from this is it's yeah. not not necessarily the choice of the Git forge, but the transfer of information. Oh, and well, you know, Constantine said it's got to be a two way street. There are folks that hate GitLab or GitHub with the, you know, heat of a thousand suns. Uh, that That's fine. You know, that's the way it is in, in our world. But I think most the, people are wrong. I'm, I'm just uh, sure. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, I think it's it's uh it's it's how do we how do we uh, take these various uh, environments and make sure we don't lose the the flow of ideas and 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 patches. So that's the the takeaway I get here. Oh, we're really over time, aren't we? Yeah, I was I was going to say we're Sorry. we're uh, uh, I want to give people at least a couple of minutes of bio break uh, before we. Okay. Uh, start our next talk at the top of the hour. Um, I think this is not the end of the conversation. Clearly, there's a lot more uh, to be said here. And certainly, I think one really good thing that things like uh, GitForges like GitLab point out is what could be, right? I mean, the automatic integration of, uh, you know, CI test with patches being promoted being proposed is a really good idea, right? And so whether we use GitLab to do that or we get Constantine to maybe put in some kind of automatic bridge between B4 and kernel CI, um, you know, clearly there is some good stuff in the workflows and other experiments you've done that, uh, you know, it's like Garrett has been improving, GitLab has been improving, uh, if we want uh, an email-based workflow to continue to be vital, um, we're going to have to step up our game, right? And so I think just simply showing us what uh, what you can do with GitLab is uh, really, really useful. And, and I want to thank you uh, for doing that in that presentation. Uh, even if you haven't, you know, convinced all of us that, you know, we should just jump on the GitLab bandwagon uh, tomorrow. So... What? Uh, I, I wasted 45 minutes and I didn't convince anybody? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Um, so thanks so much. I'm sure the conversation will continue. And uh, let's give people a five-minute break before we start the next uh, talk.